All right. So, hope I haven't scared the, uh, the remaining of you, uh, the rest of you, but let's go, let's uh, finish this. So, um, there are other type of holomorphic functions that we need to speak about. Are we almost done with integration? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> So holomorphic functions defined in terms of integrals. So you might have a function of, uh, of this form. So you might have a function f of zs equal to the integral from a to b of little f of, I don't know. Let's actually write it differently. Let's say we have the function little f of z defined as the integral of some big F of zs ds. And you observe that f of zs is holomorphic for each s. So why would you believe that this function little f of z, why would you believe this is a differentiable, a complex differentiable function? Well, easily, this integral is just a fancy sign for summation. So in essence, what we're doing is we're adding up a lot of holomorphic maps. That's what this condition means, right? So I can think of f of z as something that reminds us of a Riemann sum. And that would be then summation k goes from 1 to some n of f of z, and here we have a plus k b minus a over n times b minus a over n, right? So in essence, the, the requirement that uh, for each s, f of z comma s is holomorphic just allows us to say that f of z is roughly some sort of sum of differentiable functions. And therefore, if you were to try to take the derivative f prime of z, what do you expect? You expect that the derivative commutes with the sum. So you would expect that this would be, well, approximately the summation k equal 1 to n, f prime of z a plus k b minus a over n b minus a over n, right? So, which will then go into the integral from a to b, f prime of z s ds, right? So we expect this to happen. So, just to prove that this happens formally, we, uh, we describe the following theorem. Let capital F, let z comma s, be defined for z s belonging to omega, the region, and an interval which for all purposes we can say the interval is from 0 to 1, doesn't matter. You can just uh, reparameterize. So where omega is a region in C. So suppose F satisfies the following conditions. Okay. 
So the property is we have property i, and that f of z comma s is holomorphic. in Z for all S. That means just as before, if you fix the S, you have a holomorphic map. To F is continuous. on the interval omega 0, 1. Then the function defined as f little z integral from 0 to 1, capital F zs, yes, is holomorphic. So let's prove it. Proof. So in, in this proof, what we use, we use that intuition that integration is really just a fancy way of adding things up. It, integral is just a sum. So. What we do is, to make it more precise, what we, we define f sub n of z to be equal to 1 over n summation k goes from 1 to n of capital F of z k over n. 1 over n is just the increment, the delta z, sorry, the delta s. So then what we do is we let, first of all, first of all what we will require is let d be a subset of d closure, and d closure is contained in omega. So in other words, d is well inside of omega. So this is a disk containing z. So what we have is then this function fn, which, is, uh, which I can restrict to be from d closure cross, Well, that's actually, how should I say, not, not little f, but uh, capital F, in fact, sorry. So we have capital F. I can restrict it to d closure cross the interval 0, 1. Now, what's special about this restriction is that this restriction is what? Compact. It is compact. And if we have a continuous map, let's say by, by uh, property number two, the function is continuous, f is continuous. So if it's continuous, it has to be what? Uniform. Uniformly continuous, right? And that's really the property that is very commonly used when you do integration, uniform continuity. Is uniformly continuous. by the second condition. In other words, what we can ensure is that for epsilon bigger than 0, I can have capital F of Z1 S1 minus capital F of Z2 S2 
will be less than epsilon uh, for whenever the distance of z1 s1 and z2 s2 is less than some delta for some delta delta independent of zs right that's what uniform continuity means so in particular what i have is that the distance between little fn of z and f of z that would be the absolute value so little fn i can then write it as a sum of integrals So first observe, this is my little f of n. Do you agree that this is the same? Yes? You see, this is constant with respect to s, because this is k over n. Constant, right? Now if I integrate this constant with respect to this small interval, I get the 1 over n. And then I have the sum. So this integral, again, just be careful. You see there's no s here. That's, that's the difference, right? So that is my fn. And then I have my, my f, which is this uh, integral. I can actually break it. Let me just uh, jump the step. I can break it into a sum of integrals. You agree? I can break the interval 0 to 1 into increments of length 1 over n. And then I just, uh, I, I just have that the difference is now of, uh, of, this is my fn. And here, it's all the same except I have s. Agreed? Now, by triangle inequality, I can factor out the sum. And what I have here is the integral k minus 1 over n, k over n, absolute value f z k over n minus f z s ds. Close, uh, um, I guess I, I actually don't need the outer absolute value. I already moved. I actually jump two steps, right? I first factor the absolute value and move the, basically, you can get this by just ordinary integral operations. Now, I can select, now you see that, where is S? S varies from k minus 1 over n to k over n. So, so really S is within, a, within distance of 1 over n. So this is then going to be less than the summation k equal 1 to n, the integral k minus 1 over n, k over n, and this is epsilon ds, which is, if you just integrate and add up, this would just be n times uh, epsilon over n, which is equal to epsilon, and the assumption here is that uh, that 1 over n is less than delta. That's the important assumption. Or in other words, that the, in, in the integer n is bigger than 1 over delta. That's sufficient for this to work. 
All right, so we have uniform continuity, we create the delta, and then if we create, we means the interval is small enough, right? In this case, the z doesn't matter, right? We, we, we can even vary the z in the original definition, but z's are already aligned, they're always the same. Right, so what, do we, what have we shown? We have shown that, uh, that little fn converges uniformly to uh, little f. Hence, little f n converges uniformly to little f on the D closure. So on a compact set, which implies what? Which implies that little f is holomorphic. Right, from previous lesson, if you have uniform convergence with holomorphic maps, then the convergent is holomorphic. That's not the same as with real analysis. In real analysis, nothing like that works. All right. So what's the deal with you and the integrals? Why do you not like integrals? <laughs> I had you for calculus and it was very dramatic. <laughs> By the way, uh, you received my um, exam, right? So, I mean, I, I, you can solve five of them, but please, if you can solve all of them, you know, those are actually questions from, from some exams. So hopefully by the end of the semester, if we have time, we can cover even more questions. All right, so next topic is Schwarz reflection principle. So that's another topic that uh, is in your homework, actually. And uh, it's used quite a lot in, on the qualifying exams. So the way it's often used is that certain properties of holomorphic maps can be brought to light if uh, you expand the domain of that map. Right? So let's write that. Uh, if the map can be extended extended and the word for it is extended analytically in other words holomorphically in other words the extension is not just some continuous function but in fact the extended map is itself complex differentiable that's correct I mean, spelling-wise, spelling <laughs> analytically to a larger region. Basically, here I'm going to draw a picture, and I'm going to show you how that might intuitively why, right? And that's, in fact, uh, some of your homework questions actually make uh, make precise use of that. So suppose that. I have some sort of domain of the map. Here is the map defined on some region omega, right? And so, uh, so this is the domain of, uh, of analyticity for the function f. And then what you have is you have points. So here, this is the point a1. Here is another point a2. Here is another point a3. This is a4. And the legend is that we have f from omega to c, and that's uh, holomorphic. And we have that f of a sub k is equal to 0. So those are going to be the zeros of the map, right? So this is omega. Well, what can you tell me about this map right now? Well, the answer is not much, right? I mean, I drew something. Maybe there is no such thing in, in existence. 
right? Uh, but if I somehow figured out how to create a map over a bigger domain, and, and that bigger domain happened to be somewhat interesting, so maybe the bigger domain is like this. And then I see that, well, I, I then have here a five. And what you see is that there is convergence to A. So now you see that the extended sequence AN is now infinite. And it has a limit point in the new region omega prime. So we have that AN goes into A and A belongs to omega prime, and we have capital F from the region omega prime into C, such that F restricted to omega is my original F. Can you tell me something now about this map? Now, now it, it is very obvious what the map is. Not just constant, but yes, you're, you're, you're completely correct, constant. But in, in particular, it's zero. it's zero, right? What other constant could it be? Brilliant, right? So, so now we, we can see that f is identically zero, which implies that little f is identically zero. You see, so that's how analytic uh, continuation might be useful, one example of it. Right? I didn't know anything about this map. Uh, this uh, small region prevented me from seeing that there is a convergence of that sequence inside of domain of analyticity, and uh, therefore that this map had to be constant. Okay? So, other properties, of course, uh, can, be, uh, can be deduced. There is one um, question on your exam that, that was asking you to consider what are all the holomorphic maps that extend e to the x? where e to the x is just your regular exponential on the real line. So uh, that also relates to, this, to those ideas. So I mean, I probably spoke about this crystal, probably it went over your head because it, it was probably completely not clear in that lecture, right? But, but I, I had this, um, chemical heater, it's like, it's like a, this bag, and it, and it contains a liquid. And on this liquid, you have a button. And if you press that button, it starts to solidify. There is like a, you, you see crystallization, and it solidifies. And as it solidifies, it, it releases heat. If I'm not mistaken, that's how it goes. Right, so it's wet. You press on this thing, and it begins to solidify. Right, so that reminds me of how holomorphic maps behave. Right, as soon as you know what happens very locally, if you have like a, a small hairline of a place of, of, of a place of a region where the function is crashing to zero, so the function is those are basically zeros on that hairline, then it, they spread out. They just kind of they spread and infect the entire region. That's the that's actually not, not just the feeling. It's kind of what what roughly can happen if you look at the ge geometry of it. That's really what's what's happening. But of course, uh, this is even better than geometry because it's enough to even have a uh, convergent sequence of points. So, so let's try to um, consider uh, how we can extend functions analytically. And one, one way to do that is Schwarz reflection principle. And for Schwarz reflection principle, this is an extension that is suitable only in a specific case. So it doesn't seem as useful, but some, uh, some situations can be reduced to that specific case. So let omega be a region uh, symmetric with respect to the real line. So in other words, uh, we have that z belongs to omega if and only if the conjugate of z is in omega. 
So we can then define the positive part of the region. So that's one. And then we have this. And this is just the points below the x-axis. And we're going to define i to be the region that is the x-axis. Right? So we, we basically now broke. Broke the symmetric region can always be broken into the portion above the x-axis, the, the portion on the x-axis, and the portion below the x-axis. And of course, uh, omega plus and omega minus, they are shapes that look alike. Right? They're reflections of one another. And uh, this is the first part here, and that's called uh, symmetry principle. And it's as follows. If f plus and f minus are holomorphic, in omega plus and omega minus, respectively, And extend continuously. To I such that f plus x is equal to f minus x for all x in i. Then the map defined by f of z equal to f plus of z if z is in omega plus, f plus of z, which is the same as f minus z, if z belongs to i, and f minus of z, if z belongs to omega minus, is holomorphic. Right? So in essence, we're just trying to put those two pieces together. Right? So they agree on i. They are holomorphic here, continuous on i. You just glue them together, and you have a new, a new map. I should say holomorphic uh, over the entire region omega. What does it mean to extend continuously or before you uh, Continuously means that uh, it, 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 if you take z, if you take limit as z goes to x, where x is in i, then uh, you get the same thing as if you plug in that point. So you say you have to match up so both of them are extended? Uh, yeah, so both of them have to extend. They have to be, uh, I mean, if to be holomorphic, it has to be continuous because the differentiability implies continuity, right? So. So we have that they are holomorphic in the upper half plane, in the region of omega in the upper half plane, and the region omega in the lower half plane. And you want to stick them like two pieces of a puzzle together, right? 
So that's why they must match on I, because I is the, is the common region where they should stick. Right? And uh, uh, they have to be continuously extended, because uh, if, if, if the top function or the bottom function is discontinuous on I, then it cannot be holomorphic on that uh, segment where they stick together. We can't force them to be. They just have to be nice enough that it happens. It, they have to be nice enough that it happens, right? Uh, there are some examples that's uh, also in your, in your um, problem number one, right? So in your, in your homework, what is it, homework three that, that you are assigned, right? Mm -hmm. there, is, uh, there, is a pro there is problem one. And problem one is trying to uh, give you an impression of that you, you can have functions that um, is defined and is holomorphic in the unit disk. And it extends continuously to the boundary of the disk. But it does not extend holomorphically to, that, uh, to the boundary of the unit disk. Now, uh, if you take a unit disk, you can make it into any shape you want. You can take a Mobius transformation and make the unit disk uh, into the upper half plane, for example. See? So, uh, so, so then you have the, uh, so the, so the, the upper half plane, that would be a Schwarz reflection principle, right? So then you have an example of, uh, of a region uh, in the upper half plane, F, or F plus of Z. That, um, uh, that extends continuously to this boundary, but um, is not going to be holomorphic on this boundary, for example. Right? And you can have other examples in problem one where a continuous extension is not possible. Okay? So the, uh, it's actually very, very, very hard to force uh, those maps to do anything. They're very, very rigid. Right? That's why it's, the, the feeling is that of crystallization, that of a mosaic. Think about a mosaic. Uh, any, any region uh, that is the image of a holomorphic map is like um, a bunch of uh, a mosaic of, of uh, very slightly imperfect squares, right? So as soon as you specify one square, how it's oriented uh, under the map, right? It, it, it's right away building as a crystal. It's building up because if this is the rectangle, then the next rectangle is here, the next is here, the next is here. So, so it's feeling, it's very rigid. The only, uh, the only reason it's not completely rigid is that you are, you are allowing tiny imperfections. They are not exactly square. They are square in the limit. But still, I mean, uh, with, with other functions, you can see that, uh, that the next can be a parallelogram of a very different shape. So you can see that, uh, that the, the shape could be very, very uh, disfigured, even more so than under holomorphic maps. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. So again, two, two ways to, to think about them. Again, it is just, it's just a, um, a function from R2 to R2 that is differentiable and preserves, uh, or preserves the angle, and polynomial. Those are the two ways you think of, of those functions. All right, so let's prove it. Proof. So clearly, F is holomorphic in sigma plus union sigma minus. You agree that it's a holomorphic. Why? Because how is F defined? In sigma plus, it's a holomorphic map. In sigma minus, it's a holomorphic map. And as of yet, those are the joint regions. No trouble. We only need to show that f of z or f prime of z exists when z belongs to i. So to that effect, let d, we can, I can center it at z, doesn't matter really. Let the R of Z be contained in the closure, which is contained in omega. So here is that disk. And here is Z. Okay. 
and this region is in omega minus, you agree? And the top part is in omega plus, okay? So by Morera's theorem, By Morera's theorem, uh, it suffices to show that the integral over a triangle T of f of z, or f of, let's, let's say not z, but f of w dw is equal to what? Zero. Zero. Uh, for any triangle T that is contained in the region DRZ to establish that F prime of W exists. For any W belonging to the disk. In particular, if, if for, if for any W also at Z, right? So I'm establishing even more. Not only that it's differentiable at Z, but it's differentiable on the entire disk. And that will prove that it's differentiable at Z in particular. So there are two possibilities. So, I mean, if, of all the various triangles that you can draw, um, you can see that if you draw a triangle in the upper part in omega plus, then obviously the integral is zero because in omega plus we are integrating f plus, and in omega minus we are integrating f minus. So the only interesting case is triangles that either touch or intersect this uh, line. Great. So here is one possibility. For t, what we can do with this t is um, we can lift it. So we can lift it and that would be t epsilon. So I lifted it a little bit up. So what, we, in other words, what I do here is one if if uh, um, t touches i. Consider. T sub epsilon, which is equal to T plus epsilon. All right, now I would lift T up, or in, you know, maybe T plus. If I'm lifting it up, maybe T plus I epsilon, to be precise. All right, so I'm lifting it up. Consider T sub epsilon, which is equal to T plus uh, I epsilon. Well, you know what I mean, right? So each point is moved up. Uh, then I have that uh, the integral of t is equal to limit as epsilon goes to 0 of the integral of t epsilon f of w dw. Again, care must be taken. How do I know that? Uh, it's because the function is continuous. 
and uh, I'm using you, you properties of uniform continuity, I guess, right? So if, if this triangle is lifted a little bit, then uh, the difference between uh, this function over t epsilon and, and over t, it's really just uh, very minor, right? So I'm really, really, it's going to be the, the perimeter of this triangle times epsilon, so times whatever, you know, times, times some small uh, increment, which is the difference of those functions. So this is then limit as epsilon goes to zero, the integral t epsilon f plus. And because this is holomorphic, we know this is zero. So we, we have it. So that's case one, right? If, if it's touching from below, you just move it down. It's all the same, right? So case two. So the other possibility is the triangle is actually intersecting, in, its interior is intersecting both the upper and lower part. So something that uh, could look like this. All right, so if it intersects the upper and lower part, what you do is we, uh, we, you, can actually, you can actually break it. So you have this is this is one point of contact. So you have one triangle, here is another triangle, and here is the remaining triangle. You break it uh, break it up into triangles that are only touching. Right? So if the interior of T intersects both omega minus and omega plus break T into several triangles. Uh, whose edges that's correct edges yeah. uh, something is edge. Is that good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Edges touch x axis and repeat argument one. In other words, this, right? So you reduce it to that case where the triangle is either in the upper portion or the lower portion and only an edge is touching and then you just lift it separate them right and, and by losing those properties you just see that uh, uh, that in, in all cases in any case the integral over t of f of w dw is equal to zero which implies that f is holomorphic in DRZ. Now, question, where did we use the fact that uh, we need the functions continuously extending to, to this boundary? Here. 
right, in the lifting. You see that uh, the fact that I'm, I can lift this edge and not worry about it, that means that uh, it's continuously extendable. Okay, so you see when, when I do this argument that I'm moving this triangle slightly, either uh, up or down, that's where I'm using uh, using continuity. You mean this uh, limit to epsilon zero? Yeah, meaning that, that if I push this uh, limit towards zero, then the values of this function on this blue line will match the values on the red line oh. in the limit. Okay, so that's where I, I were, were using it. But of course, yeah. But of course, you know that those conditions are required to begin with, because otherwise uh, we, we have this continuity inside of the region, which, which makes it not holomorphic. But, so it was necessary, but this, we, this shows it's sufficient. All right, so Schwartz reflection principle. Theorem. So this is called Schwartz reflection principle. Both on the exam and uh, on your homework, there is a question that uh, utilizes this principle. Suppose. F is holomorphic in some region omega plus and extends continuously. to i such that the image of i is subset of r. So that means that the function is real valued on i. Then there is a function f holomorphic in omega such that the function f restricted to omega plus is little f. So Proof. Intuition. So the intuition is, let's draw here is uh, the region, here this line is i, this is omega minus, and this is omega plus. So we have a function defined in omega plus. And we want to have a function that extends it that is defined in omega minus. So what can we do? Well, if I pick a point here, this is point z. And just um, as indicator, let's see. So we have some point Z, and we just uh, select two rays. And this makes angle theta. Right? Now, how should this function at this uh, Z be defined? We only have a function in this region. So we want uh, this point to be moved into this region. 
so that f can act on it, right? So then what I'll do first, I'll take the conjugate, and it will be mapped. Here. So that's z bar. You see, it seems like a natural option, right? I want this point to be in the domain of f so that f can act on it. So then what I have is my first operation is z into z conjugate. And what can you say about this operation? Is it, is it conformal or not? No, no it is anti-conformal. So this is anti anti-conformal, right? Then the next operation that I have is I, I apply f. Now, from here to here, what can you say about the action from here to here? Conformal or anti-conformal? It's, it's flipped twice. Yeah, no, no, not yet. It has not been flipped twice. So from here to here, it's conformal. You see, so from here to here, angle sense is not preserved, right? Mm -hmm. The magnitude of the angle is preserved, but not its sense. So first operation is anti-conformal. Next is conformal. For the entire process to be conformal, what must I do next? Or well, what possibility? What, one easy one. Uh, well, we have this is, this is our new number, right? So we need to reflect it again. So what we do is we take f of z bar and take the conjugate again. And that is another anticonformal. Make sense? And the entire motion from here to here is conformal. So, so my intuition is that to extend it to here, this is going to be defined as f of z bar and another conjugate. You see why, right? So uh, I mean, it's pretty natural if you think this is moved here. So now f can act on it. But, uh, but, uh, but because I moved it by reflection, the entire pr the process will not, be, uh, will not be conformal, therefore not holomorphic. So I will need to take another conjugate to, uh, to reflect it twice, OK? So let's actually now take this intuition and uh, show that just we can do that formally, like Einstein. Define capital F of Z to be equal to little f of z if z belongs to <coughs> omega plus union i. So we have this little z. It extends continuously, right? It extends continuously to i, so, so I can do that. And then I, I'm going to define this to be f of z bar another conjugate if z is in the bottom region. So what we want to show is that this map is holomorphic. So how we do that, we say if z0 belongs to omega minus, let d of radius r around z0 be such that it's contained in its closure and then contained in omega minus. Omega minus is um, region, right? Then then I can say that the set of all points 
or should I call this, uh, let's call this uh, dr star centered at the zero bar, which is set of all points z such that set of all points uh, z conjugate such that uh, z belongs to the r of z zero. So in other words, it's like I'm taking this disk and I'm reflecting it in the upper half plane, right? And this will be then contained in omega plus. So we have, uh, we, we, because of that, because we have this disk, we can, we can define Well, we can define an expansion around the zero. So uh, I should write it maybe like this. So, so we have that f of z is going to be equal to the infinite sum from zero to infinity, a sub n z minus z zero bar to the n. is the representation, the power series representation. It's the power series representation uh, of F in the R star Z zero. So what does it mean? It means that f of if z belongs to if z belongs to um, the disk of radius r around z zero, we have that f of z will be equal to little f of z bar with a conjugate which is then equal to the summation n equal to 0 to infinity a sub n z bar minus z 0 bar to the n conjugate. And conjugate actually works even through infinite sum. So what we will have is which is a represent which is a representation of a power series, which implies that f of z is holomorphic. in dr z0. Make sense? Is it immediate that the conjugate is on the infinite sum? Well, that's a good question. If the series converges, that's definitely true. Right? If it doesn't converge, then the sum is meaningless. So, I mean, uh, so we, we have convergence. In fact, we will have absolute convergence. So uh, how would you show that this is so? You are gonna, you are gonna reduce it to a finite sum plus the error. The error just vanishes, it doesn't matter, right? So you're, you're going to compare this uh, conjugate with a conjugate of a finite sum plus the error. So you are going to see that the difference between the infinite conjugate and the finite conjugate is vanishing. It's the same as doing partial sums, no? Yeah, the same as doing partial sums, that's precisely right. So you, would, you just, uh, you just uh, uh, state that it's true for partial sums, and you just take the conjugate for this function plus, uh, plus the error. Right, and the error vanishes to zero, so that's why it works. All right, so uh, what we have shown is now that the function is, um, is uh, holomorphic in the region omega plus, omega minus. Now, by symmetry principle, because uh, f of z extends uh, to the real line continuously, right? So that uh, by symmetry principle, we have, uh, we have that the map is holomorphic on all of omega. 
They sometimes ask, uh, I mean, for, for theorems, if there is like a, they might ask, prove the Schwarz reflection principle on a qualifying example. Right? So using the symmetry principle, Uh, we conclude that F is holomorphic uh, over omega. Now, notice what we required for the reflection principle, the function a little f had to be real on the x-axis. And the reason for that is that, for, you see, we would have f of z bar closure. Well, then, you see, you see what we, if z is real, that would have to be f of z conjugate. They must be equal. You see that? So if I define it this way, if z is real, then here I am assuming z is real. So the conjugate over z does nothing. So what we have is that, uh, is that uh, and, and, and so we have this, and we have to have a match. We have to have f of z. They have to match it. At, 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 uh, it must be equal to f of z conjugate. So that's why the requirement that it has to be real. See? For, for, this, for the two pieces of the puzzle to stick together. Yep? All this stuff we did, could we translate so the symmetry can be on the line instead of the real axis? Yes, that's precisely right. So, uh, so then what you can do with this principle is, uh, let's say you might have a function defined inside of a disk. Now what can you do with the disk? You can then unfold the disk, make it the upper half plane. Use the symmetry and, and, and build the other part of the plane, and then use a Mobius transformation to bring it back to the disk. One of the exercises, that's exactly what's, what's happening there. You understand? So if you, uh, the, the reason this, this is uh, actually such a powerful tool is, here is what, can, what is true. I mean, this is the Riemann mapping theorem. The Riemann mapping theorem tells, it tells us uh, something really very weird. I think weird. I mean, it's complicated, definitely, right? So take any region that is simply connected, mean, meaning that uh, it has no holes, right? It's just a one solid uh, amoeba-like thing. And it does not equal to the entire complex plane. So in other words, it's not off of C. If you take that region, there exists a map that will make it look like the unit disk. So in other words, there is a map that can bring it to the unit disk. If you can bring it to the unit disk, you can bring it to the upper half plane. You understand? So in essence, uh, if, if you have a blob, if you have a, a holomorphic map defined on a blob, and the blob is very complicated, how can I apply Schwarz reflection principle? I can just uh, conjugate this map with various Mobius maps and a bunch of other stuff, right? Uh, bring it into the unit disk, or be better, bring it into the upper half plane where the uh, where the reflection principle, where Schwarz reflection principle can be applied, and then just br bring it back. You see, that's how. That's why this 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 thing is. It seems very restrictive, but actually is is uh, pretty much. It extends to all extent. Uh, it, it it describes all possible exp extensions if you have the Riemann mapping theorem, in theory at least. <laughs> because in practice, <laughs> <laughs> how do you move the solution? I don't know. Right? Yeah. The Riemann mapping theorem doesn't. Cannot possibly give any canonical functions that send any blob to the canonical. So these things wouldn't actually. We don't have equations. Um, well, not that I mean no. There there are no easy equations, but there is uh, there is basically uh, exact equations for polygons, right? So the so there is uh, if you look into it, there is schwarz christoffel integral, which talks about how to do that for for a, for a blob that is uh, that has straight edges. In that, so in other words, you can do you can take a blob approximated by uh, by a polygonal blob, and for the polygonal blob there is a precise procedure. Okay. That's how it's used, really, right? That's how the practice. But for for the true blob, <laughs> right? So there are there are complications there, and some of them I don't know deeply enough that they become very technical. All right. So you, you follow how this, this, this I mean, you, you can remember this proof, it's pretty nice. Uh, and you can also, it, it, intuitively, you can construct it uh, just when you, when you consider what holomorphic maps are. They're conformal maps, right? So you see that there is pretty much little you can think of uh, as what, what else can you do with a function that you don't know its formula for. All right. Uh, 
How much time do we have? Ten minutes. All right. So let's cover. Uh, now we begin talking about meromorphic maps. So we're in chapter three in this book. Hopefully, move fast enough through the chapter. It's too bad. I actually wanted to ask you another question, but we haven't yet covered this, this chapter. That's why I haven't. So, Mero more fake functions. So first, uh, basically a bunch of definitions. That's what we will do today. Maybe a theorem. Zeros and poles. So just a bunch of definitions. So we have point singularity. And that's just a complex number. Z0 such that f of z0 is not defined. But f is defined in some disk dr z0 minus z0. So it's defined in the punctured neighborhood. Okay? So that would be called point singularity. So there's a one hole, in the, in, and in that point, uh, the function is not defined. Uh, and you would say it's removable uh, and that would mean that uh, limit as z goes to z sub 0 of f of z is, it, it exists. That's a removable singularity. I think actually with holomorphic maps will require more, but with this it has to be differentiable. But we'll get there. So then we have uh, we'll begin characterizing them. So there is point singularity, and one other important uh, type of singularity is pole singularity, and that means that uh, limit as z goes to z0 of f of z is infinity. And the reason this is called a pole, I think, is very obvious. Because in two dimensions, right? So it feels like, well, it feels like there is something at that point z0 that is sticking out. And, uh, for, and, and the paper is just, like, it just, just sliding along that, that line that is sticking out to infinity. So that would be a pole singularity. So what should we say? Uh, that's pole singularity. Then we have uh, 0. So 0 just means that f of z0 is equal to 0. And f is holomorphic. So instead of calling this a root, uh, I mean, actually, a root would be also a nice word because locally it's a polynomial. Right? So this is like the root of that polynomial. And uh, one, one thing we know about it, um, if f is non-constant, zeros are isolated. We showed that, right? So the zeros cannot, uh, cannot coalesce to a limit point, because otherwise the function is constant or 0. But remember that it's possible to coalesce to a limit point as long as the limit point is not in the domain of holomorphicity. We, we showed the example of cosine of something 1 plus z over 1 minus z, something like that, right? The rule of the singularity is a discontinuity, right? Uh, singularity is, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a discontinuity, but could be, could be more, right? So yeah, singularity, I guess, yeah, I guess discontinuity. 
Yeah, why not? Because you said that the limit exists. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess I guess you can say it just it's just discontinuity. That's that's good enough. Okay. Right. All right. So it makes sense, by the way, that uh, when they say they are isolated, they are isolated with respect to the region omega. They cannot have a limit point in the region omega. But they can have a limit point outside of that region, possibly. And the function might still be uh, non-constant. All right. So let's prove the first uh, theorem about the zeros. Theorem. Suppose. Oh, before I prove it, I haven't listed it here. It's going to be listed later. But there is also there is a removable singularity pole zero and something known as essential singularity. So what is an essential singularity? It means. Um, a singularity that is not a pole, not non-removable and not a pole. That is not removable and not a pole. Okay, so the limit does not go to infinity; limit oscillates, right? Uh, and uh, we cannot remove it. So anyhow, we will deal with that later. So let's just state this theorem. Suppose f from omega to c is holomorphic. And we have that f of z0 is equal to 0. And f is not identically 0. Then there is a neighborhood U in omega of the zero um, a non vanishing. Holomorphic function G on U and a unique integer and bigger than zero such that F of Z is equal to Z minus Z zero to the power n <coughs> times g of z for all z belonging to u. So in essence, what is that really it's telling us? If a polynomial has a 0 at z0, then I can factor z minus z0 either once or twice or three times, uh, some sort of number of times. Pretty much just like what you have for polynomials. Right? This, this is a consequence. It's inspired completely by the idea that f is locally a polynomial. Make sense? So let's prove it. Proof. So what we do is we are going to let, we're going to pick some disk of radius r centered at z0, whose closure is inside of omega. where r is small enough so that f of z is not equal to 0 unless z is equal to z0. And we can do that because the singularity, sorry, the um, Zero, zero must be isolated. This point must be isolated. You agree? So uh, we are going to 
say that u is our dr of z0. So, sorry, I'm keeping you guys. Let me just finish this very quickly. So what we have is then what can we do? We can expand the function f of z as a polynomial. And that polynomial will be uh, starting at m and going to infinity, a sub n, z minus z0 to the n, for z belonging to u. I just uh, call this uh, disk u now. And where a m is the first non-zero term. So what we then have is that f of z is z minus z0 to the power m. I can factor it. And then I have a sub m plus a sub m plus 1 z minus z0. And this is my g of z. Okay. So clearly. g of z never equals to 0 in u. Now, why is it clear? Because we already we know that f is not 0 anywhere except for z0, right? Now, if I plug z0 here, everything vanishes except for a sub m, right? So we know that g of z can never be equal to 0. And uh, m is unique because, because um, if, we, if I have f of z equal to z minus z0 to the m g of z. And that ends up being equal to z minus z0 to the power of n h of z. That will imply several conditions. First condition is that if n is bigger than m, if n is bigger than m, and then we have that g of z equals to z minus z0 to the n minus m times h of z, which then implies that g of z0 is equal to 0. <coughs> Contradiction. Agreed it's a contradiction. Um, if n is smaller than m, similar argument. Works. So you see that m cannot be either bigger or smaller than uh, m. And they must be the same. Good? So again, what we have shown is just something basic for polynomials that if it has a 0 uh, at z sub 0, then z minus z sub 0 must be a factor. Or maybe it has a multiplicity m. That's the, the multiplicity of the 0. All right, so see you on Wednesday. <laughs>